good afternoon. I want to welcome everyone to this uh, fifth lecture in our alumni lecture series. The first, first four speakers, just to recollect, were Anand Rajaraman from Walmart Labs. Then we had um, Sumantran, um, also from the automotive site, coincidentally. Um, then we had Ram Sitaram from ExxonMobil, who talked about the energy demand situation outlook for the world. And the most recent speaker was uh, Professor Kumar from Georgia State, who, was, um, who spoke on marketing and branding and so on. Our um, speaker today is Venkatesh Prasad with uh, Ford Motor Company. He is a 1984 alumnus, MSEE, and we are delighted to have him here. Um, as, um, as we have constituted this lecture series, we are trying to invite alumni who are in leadership positions in various industries so that they can give both our faculty, our students, as well as the local alumni, a feel for what are the latest developments in the various industries that, um, that they are leaders of. So in that context, I think it's uh, very appropriate to have Venkatesh as, um, as our speaker today. Um, I'll just give you a brief intro. Um, he got his uh, PhD in electrical and computer engineering from Rutgers University in 1990. Uh, his master's degree was from Washington State University. Um, his um, engineering degrees are from uh, the MS degree from IIT Madras in 1984 and NIT Trichy in 1980. Uh, he joined Ford in 1996 and before that he worked as a senior scientist at Rico Innovations in Menlo Park developing automatic lip reading as a novel human machine interface. He was also at Caltech and NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, where he worked on the world's first telerobotic visual surface inspection system to help design the International Space Station. With Ford, uh, Nikitesh is the leader of the team responsible for research and architecture of electrical, electronics, and embedded software technologies. He's a member of Ford's 12-person Global Technology Advisory Board, and he is also the senior technical leader of vehicle design and infotronics for Ford Research and Innovation. He is Ford's What's Next guy and responsible for the research, architecture, standards, applications development, and vehicle system integration of electrical, electronics, and embedded software technologies. So I believe he's going to tell us what's next. Um, I invite Venkatesh to deliver his talk on the next billion automobiles as connected cocoons and agents for a cause. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, my, my distinct pleasure and, and honor uh, to be back, back in, uh, at a second home. Uh, it's always nice to come back and, and almost just show up and, and have a free lunch, too. So I think it was, it was really nice to be back here today to meet uh, friends from many years ago and, and colleagues. Uh, it's, it's a special, special pleasure to come back and be able to share some thoughts with you. It's also, of course, uh, psychologically, it sort of it takes a little bit of adaptation for me because it looks like CLT has shrunk over the last 30 years. <coughs> but it used to be this, this huge big hall, and I used to sit somewhere in the back and watch a speaker in the distance. Uh, but here I am. So it's, it's really nice to be back here um, and, and really sh share with you um, a personal journey that has the, the cloak and dress of, of a car and maybe the story of a billion cars and the story of the next billion. Uh, I think those are all um, very exciting aspects of, of my journey. But I think the most important exciting piece is that all of you and many of you here stand um, or sit here uh, in front of me with, uh, with that journey ahead of you and others of you are really in a position to steer that, that journey as, as people come to you uh, and as you teach them. So I think it's really an exciting um, combination of, of who I see in front of you and I, I certainly wish to have a, um, a, um, a dialogue and discussion as we, as we go through the presentation here. Uh, so I, I certainly appreciate the opportunity. Uh, I, I thought when I, when I uh, got the opportunity to speak here, um, I sort of thought through what might be interesting and exciting. I think it's really um, um, uh, a lot that's happened in the automobile itself, and I could spend a day speaking about what's happening within cars and within, uh, with, with the um, collaboration of some terrific 
uh, colleagues of mine uh, what happens in, in every aspect of the car, whether it's the engine or motors these days and, and the powertrain or how cars get built. Um, but I think um, I might do justice to, to sort of the fact that I'm here and, and where the, the road to the future is heading by speaking about the network effect of cars. So there are a billion cars, trucks and buses on the planet today. Um, and by that, I mean licensed automobiles, whether they're, um, and, and this doesn't include two-wheelers and three-wheelers um, and off-road vehicles. And so my talk is going to focus mostly on, on how the next billion are in some sense going to be so dramatically different from, from this first billion, and then how we can work backwards, in some sense solve the inverse problem of, of trying to architect the best components to match the desired outcome. And the desired outcome really is going to be um, a, a useful, valuable, personal mobility solution in the context of a large urban set of, of cities that are going to be um, certainly with us for a long, long time to come, certainly with the next generation as, as they grow up. So there's going to be, in the course of, of the next few decades, 19 cities in the 20th, in this century, that will have uh, 20 million um, or more people in the in the metro area. And so when you look at 19 cities or so um, in this 20, billion, uh, 20 million context, um, that's a really big and different kind of a problem to, uh, to face. And, and really we can come together in interesting ways to solve that problem um, of, of personal mobility solutions in the context of of what are sometimes referred to as the mega cities, these 20 million cities with 20 million or more in population. So I think uh, I'll share some of those um, those thoughts with you. Let me get this get this up. Uh, just a little bit of, of, of sort of the uh, speaking to the title. There's, there's two parts to it. One is uh, um, obviously people get into cars because they want to have the choice of of being able to go anywhere, anytime, and they like that choice to be exercised. Um, in in a immediate sense of comfort, so you want the car to be um, the seats to be comfortable, the drive to be relatively smooth, potholes notwithstanding. Uh, you want to be able to listen to your own um, sources of, of entertainment, if you will, whether it's, it's music or um, maybe a, 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 the news. Um, and so there's that aspect of, of a comfortable cocoon that you associate with a car. Otherwise, you might exercise other choices. Um, so that part is, is obviously going to continue to grow in its own ways. The second part of, of the title here is, is somewhat interesting and, it, and it's very, very relevant because as cars get more sophisticated, they are really a platform of computers and a platform of sensors and a platform of actuators that are all networked. And so you can look at every, every car as a fairly sophisticated computer that can be then repurposed or in part also purposed for a cause. And by a cause I mean it could be a societal cause such as trying to reduce um, smog in a city. It could be a societal cause such as trying to do something with either detecting potholes or trying to look at areas of accident. But being able to automatically offer data that can be aggregated in useful ways by city planners um, to create a better and more useful information system for, for personal mobility. So the focus of, of a lot of what, what I'm going to say is in fact on personal mobility, but the point is that automobiles can become causes, can become agents for a good cause, and, and there's work already happening in that context. Uh, I just took the liberty, one of the things about being, nice thing about being an alum is you can go do a screen scrape and not get, you know, not seriously offend someone. So I took the, <laughs> the liberty of, of, of taking this from our web page here and saying, well, what does this mean? What does the education that we get here in a sort of holistic sense uh, mean to sort of um, contributing to the planet as a whole and really to, uh, to one small tiny component? Um, what I've shown here is a, is a car that's available on the roads. It's a Ford Figo. Uh, it's, um, as I said, I could speak a lot about the car itself, but I think um, the focus today is really going to be how this small component plays uh, uh, an increasingly important role both in terms of being a cocoon, but all, and also in terms of being an agent for, for, a, for a valid cause, as we um, try to solve and put this in the backdrop of, uh, against the backdrop of a complex planetary system. 
And, and I think the, the other point that's worth noting is just what does education give? And so maybe I'll just do a quick poll. How many BTEC students are here in the class? It's pretty good. Okay, fantastic. Uh, how many master's students of any kind? And got a few hands. And how many faculty members, if I may ask? And, and how many others visiting? So I guess the rest. So I can do my arithmetic. So this is great. So I think, I think it's really exciting because when I was a, an undergrad and when I was a grad student, we were sort of a lot, for the most part, we were within chimneys. We were within a department and we worked with others within a department. You solved, within, you solved problems that were given to you within the scope of what your department had to offer, which was really good. We had, um, no doubt, created a good foundation for, for education. But we also had things like in-plant training or you went out for a summer and worked somewhere within an industry. And typically the industry was within your area of specialization. So if you were a mechanical engineer, you worked in a firm in a mechanical engineering context. If you were in civil, you worked with the, maybe a construction company and you came back. And that was really good grounding. Uh, what's changed now is that um, everything's networked. So you have access to all kinds of, of, uh, of data and all kinds of information. So you can start having effect almost in anything um, that is way outside your formal classification. Your, your, your classification of whether you're a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer or an electrical engineer happens almost just by chance. It just happens because of you know, a set of Russian relay um, positions. And so I think the point I'm trying to make here is that whether you are any one of those, you know, it's all the way from aerospace down to, I've got to get my glasses off, you know, ocean engineering and down to physics in that listing here. Uh, there is a absolutely tangible role to play in terms of having an impact both on the complex um, sort of requirements and needs of the planet as a whole, and really maybe looking at, in this case, in the context of today, looking at one small component. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of spend a few minutes on that component. It's sort of interesting. I know that a little uh, uh, somewhat well. I also have, therefore have a little bias to that, and I'll sort of then get to, to this piece here. So just this, a little bit on, on the one small component piece. Um, the, the automobile has, um, has really a large number of, of technologies and, and business um, decisions that uh, are associated with, with sort of the creation of the product itself. Um, and no doubt there's an, a lot of, of design considerations that go into the, to the creation of an automobile. So when I work at Ford, oftentimes I'm asked, or I ask myself why I'm there. And one of the, one of the reasons, obviously it's, it's working with great people, but it's really great people across uh, what I think are the top 10 engineering schools, the top 10 design schools, and the top 10, um, I'd say, business schools. So, so you really have to make a hard decision on everything you do and how you do things and, and the impact of what you do. So if you take the automobile, obviously there's, there's great, there's design there that comes from a designer's mind, the right side of the brain. Um, and that design now takes various forms that, that appeal to the consumer. But there's also hardcore solutions of Navier-Stokes equations. So as the, wind, the aerodynamic flow matters. It matters to reduce the wind resistant, resistance. It matters to therefore improve fuel economy. It matters therefore also to, to reduce wind noise. It then matters to, uh, and that reduction in wind noise reduces the interior cabin noise that then makes your automobile uh, a better cocoon, if you will. So these things are all interrelated. Uh, you can then hop from, from fairly complex um, integral equations to, to strokes of a paintbrush, you know, essentially during the course of one day. Um, so I think what's happened is that the automobile has become a fascinating confluence for, for all disciplines coming together in interesting and different ways. Uh, you could, of course, take your favorite smartphone and say that's a fascinating device, and it is. Um, so fa phones are fascinating. The iPhone is the icon of, of design, um, and, 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 and there's no question about that. Uh, but the iPhone or any smart device that you have is a phenomenal device that's been tuned to zero kilometers an hour. The automobile, that small component of a larger system, is a device that has to be tuned to 60 kilometers an hour and has to be prepared to meet another small component coming at 60 kilometers an hour towards it. And, and maybe it's a less small component. You have a lorry coming to you, towards you, and, and the lorry is going at 100 kilometers an hour and you're going at 60. The laws of physics there um, work and they don't get... Um, they don't, they're not subservient to, to any action that you might be taking. And so from a design standpoint, it's a phenomenal challenge. Uh, from a structural design standpoint, from the standpoint of engineering a solution that's, that's uh, robust and can stand the test of time, uh, it's, a, it's another big challenge. And from the standpoint of clearly managing the business of, of being able to make that affordable, uh, it's a third dimension of challenge.